Hello and welcome everybody to our very last program for Family History Month. Oh my goodness, it has been a wild ride with all of you. It's been a very busy month for all of us. I hope some of you were able to have the opportunity to do some research, share stories with your family, uh, all that good stuff just in time for the upcoming holiday season. So thank you for joining us. So today's program is just a little mini half hour Ask the Expert session where our very own John Beatty, who is here, uh, he and I will answer some questions about writing your family history. John has way more experience writing family history than I do, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, while all of you are thinking of your wonderful questions, because I know you will have some questions, let's, John, let's just talk for a little bit. Um, we were talking uh, actually before the program about how, you know, a lot of people who talk to me about writing their family history, they're like, how do I, how do I get started doing this? Uh, you know, I have this, all these resources, I have all these sources, I've been doing this for 20 years. How do I make a story out of this? And uh, how do I organize it in a way that makes sense? It's really overwhelming for people when they're first getting started. So what suggestions would you have? Well, the first thing I would suggest is to come in and take a look at some of the family histories that we already have on the shelf. We have over 70,000 of them here um, and get some ideas of what, what's been done on different families and again, get, get a, a sense of what's out there and what other people have done. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, obviously, if you want to publish professionally, there's, a, there are some, there's some guidelines for that, but I wouldn't stress about it if you're just getting started. I, I would take it as a sandwich and you eat a sandwich one bite at a time. And, and I would focus on a single family and, and put that family together as best you can, arranging it to, and, 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 and start right there. Um, uh, a lot of people, there are different ways of writing a family history. Um, you can do a genealogy where you start with someone in the past and track down their descendants, or you start with someone in the present and trace their ancestors back. That's one way of doing it. But there are narrative family histories. Many of those are in our, our, our collection, which are interesting stories that have been gathered that, that, that tell the story of a family. And that isn't necessarily a genealogy. Uh, it's, it's, it's finding a, a way of writing in a creative sort of way that tells an interesting story. You could tell your own memoirs uh, or, or, or start gathering stories that you've heard about your family and arranging it in some kind of chronological fashion that's interesting. And, and, and putting it on paper uh, or putting it down and writing it. Um, I like to ask the question of, of if you won't do it, who will? Uh, and, and sometimes if, if you don't do it, it may never get written. Um, so don't be intimidated, just start writing and worry about more stuff down the, the pipe, but, but get, getting stories down, getting your words down, getting the, the narrative down is what's really important initially. One of the things that Kurt Witcher our director of special collections likes to say is don't let perfection get in the way of progress you know just do it and make it perfect later right so just work on it get it done but start small um we are starting to get some questions in the q a super excited keep adding those questions into the q a so they don't get lost so the first question is, what suggestions would you have for someone who feels like there is no story? Well, there's always some kind of story and you can always read yeah. back stories. Even if your family doesn't have much of a story, you can still read books about the time period that they lived and the place that they lived to give you a sense of the backstory, even if you don't have many stories about them. So if they were living in Ohio in 1850, well, there's all sorts of histories of, of individual counties. There are Midwestern histories. There's, there, are, there are social histories that talk about what family life was like. So you can get some material out of it. And you, if you look very carefully at sources, like even a will or a, or a census record, you can get the information out of it. You can look at, for many people who had farms, there are, for example, agricultural schedules. You can figure out what what was growing in their fields, how much they, uh, land they had in corn and oats and wheat and so on. So you can put together some stories with a little bit of imagination and a little bit of digging that, that you yeah. may not think are there at, at initially. Yeah, so it's basically, um, so when I formerly worked at the Tenement Museum, their thing was very much 
putting people in context. So the people who lived in this historic tenement building in New York, you know, other than a, some, a handful of documents, not much is actually known about what their exact day-to-day -day lives were. So as an educator, one of my jobs was to give tours. We're given tour content. That is, this is what we absolutely know about the family. This is what the history was like. This is what New York was like in this time period. This is what a Jewish family's experience might be like in this time period. And we were told, make a story. So you're putting what you know, the names, the dates, the locations into the bigger context. So basically, where does your family fit in the wider story of the world, their state, their county, their town? There's always a story. Mm -hmm. Newspapers can be great too. Sometimes you can find little tidbits of things, even if they weren't very important people, they, they still might be stories about so-and-so visiting so-and-so or so-and-so being sick or, you know, you can, you can piece some interesting little tidbits out of, out of things. So the next question is someone from someone named Diane. She said, I am writing a book about my great grandparents and their seven kids. I'm covering years from birth of Gil, in 1831 to the death of Sarah in 1924. Major blocks are decades, but within decades, I do my family member, I do by family member or by year. Well, that's the question. Do I do it by family member or by year? Um, I would do it I'm by kinda, family member because that's more yeah. coordinated. I mean, year by year, is, it's, it's, it's too disjointed. I mean, it, it, events carry over year by year to, to, yeah. to, 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 to so, segments of years and so you really need to look at the person pulling it together that way uh, that's how I would arrange yeah. it she said that she's kind of doing it by a family member for that decade after the kids are grown um, but she's really struggling with structure you might have situations where families interact and so you, so focusing on one particular person will negate the other parts of the story so it may be you don't do it by year, but put it in a, in a decade. Look, look for breaks in time when certain things happened, and and, and yeah. frame a chapter that way. Like this, this is the school years. This was the uh, maybe they uh, moved. The, yeah, maybe there were yeah. different places they lived, or some kind of thing that breaks it apart, and and then tell the story of how the family interacted uh, within that chapter. So that, I've, I've seen them done that way. You could do it if you're just trying to figure out structure write it and then break it apart right yeah so you can get a picture of the whole situation that's one of the ways i would do it the beauty of word processors unlike typewriters you can cut and paste you can save parts you can do all kinds of things and nothing gets wasted and you can always move it around you can always change it you can always put it back so yeah great Okay, so just as a reminder, friends, put your, your burning questions in the Q&A, but I see some of you in the chat are having lovely conversations. That's great. Laying down the tracks with stories and then rearrange as it needs being. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one person asked, can we see an online index of the family histories that are at your library? Yeah, you can search in our library catalog. In fact, I can show you how I would recommend doing it. Okay. So if you're on our homepage, genealogycenter.org, see how there are two search bars here? If you want to search our catalog, use this top one. Ignore the login button. It doesn't apply to us. So say we were looking for the Hodges family. So you could just search Hodges, you could search Hodges family. I kind of like to search Hodges family first, like adding family after the surname, it just behaves better for me. Okay, so once you press find, this is your search results page. Anytime you're using our catalog, no matter what it is for, always just get in the habit of going over to this left-hand side saying filter results, click branch, click genealogy. If you don't, you will get things that are unrelated to what you're searching for. That's books that are in other departments or in other branches. You don't want that. So 
it filters it down to the things that we have in our department. You can even filter it down more. But notice how in the subject, we search Hodges family, but we have these other family names. These are going to be collateral lines that are mentioned in those books, or Hodges is mentioned in those books. So you might find a book on the Brown family, but because I search Hodges family, it comes up. That means the Hodges family is mentioned in the Brown family history. So that is basically how you would find family histories in our department. Did that, I hope that explanation made sense. <laughs> um, some of these books are, some of these older genealogies are digitized. So be aware yeah. that you can, you can go and look on Internet Archive and, uh, or even on Family Search and, and look at some examples of older genealogies that are out of copyright. And you might yeah. get some ideas. The, the, the art of genealogical writing, and it is a, an art, has changed over time. And some of these earlier genealogies didn't have much in them. They were just bare bones kinds of things. But they're still interesting to look at and, and worth looking at. So There are some that you can tell somebody paid a lot of money to have this thing done back when sources, water sources. Like I saw one where it was trying to say that this person was a descendant of Odin. Uh, it, yeah, <laughs> which they're fascinating from a like, I guess historiography standpoint, but <laughs> that's like a good source material, but that's a, that's a program for another day. Okay. So the next person had said that she was going to inherit some cassette tapes of conversations between her great grandfather and her grandfather. And she's really excited to listen to them. And she was wondering how she would incorporate those into a written story. Also, if I digitize the tapes, should I also keep the physical tapes? I would keep the tapes, although they're going to degrade over time. But, but having yeah. digital copies, I would recommend doing that right away. And having a, a, a good digital copy of it is great. And then storing that in, in a format, either off storage in, in, a, in a cloud or hosting it somewhere, you want to have multiple copies of it and save it um, digitally. Uh, but then you can listen to it carefully and you can extract um, stories, quotes, things that you want to use for it for your book. So. Uh, those are really great to have. Depending on the conversation and like how much talking over each other they might be doing or not doing, you might even be able to make a transcription of it and like stick that in an appendix or something. That's really cool. I wish I had tapes like that. So the next question my cousin has given some short stories she wrote about our mother's family. She has included photos. I'm working on fleshing out the facts. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I've been given different photos at times and little short snippets of stories. And it is challenging sometimes to try to piece those together with the facts. Because it's like, who, who are these people? How does this pertain? I was given, I was going, my, I'm going through some of my aunt's files and she's been doing this for 30 years. And I got, I found a photo of a picture, of a frame picture of what John and I realized is a picture of W.B. Yeats framed on a mantelpiece with some like wooden mallard doc, ducks. I'm like, what does this have to do with this folder? It might just slipped in there, I don't know. <laughs> So yeah, piecing together the things that you're given and then putting it into the story is always challenging but fun too. Okay, so this is an excellent question. Uh, would you suggest that people specifically focus on genealogies and chronological histories or writing personal stories? You know, you really need to do both, but I, I would get the personal stuff down first because those are the things that if they don't get written down, they may never be recorded at all and, uh, and, and have some record of those. And, and you can do writing as you, as you research and, and do little, little pieces of research that you write up rather than trying to think of it in a, in a big comprehensive way. So if you have a set of stories, write those down, get them done, save them in a file, 
and they can always incorporate those into a larger project if you decide to work on a, on a larger genealogy. But I would I would think of it in snippets and try to get parts and pieces down while you can, and and then uh, and, and save them as files. Yeah, small bites make things less less painful. Uh, I will say, uh, I personally find reading family histories that are just descendancy lists, like this person married this person, these are their children, and then generation to generation, and there's zero narrative, I find them really boring. Um, so it all kind of, I think it stems to who are you writing this for? Mm -hmm. That should be your first question. Are you writing this for you? Are you writing this uh, maybe for your kids, maybe for other family members? And if so, you know, what, how can you do it in a way that would make them want to read it? In the bibliography that's in your handout there, I put a variety of different kinds of books in here. We have actually a large number of books in the Genealogy Center about how to how to write, how to write family histories, how to write yeah. memoirs, how to write autobiographies, all kinds of things. And I, I pulled some, one of them is called How to Write Compelling Stories for Your Family, uh, from Your Family's History, which is a, a nice little book that I hadn't really looked at until recently that talks all about how to write a, a, an interesting family narrative uh, and, and how to put it together. It's, it's a nice little book. It's not a genealogy type of book. It's a book about how to sort of creatively write a short snippet of, of family history, but it's, it's really quite good. And they run the, of the, ga the, the gamut. There are things from England that, that, that take a British perspective. There's a lot of different books on how to write uh, near family narratives, but then there are also things on how to write and craft a genealogy. And um, uh, I don't want to discourage anybody from just doing a genealogy uh, if, if that's what you want to do, but, you, but I would try to encourage you to add meat, quote unquote, to it, yeah. to, to, to add the stories, add the proofs and things to tell the story a bit more than just names and dates because it makes a much better story that way. Uh, and and well, if you really want to get professional Our ancestors were more it, than names and yeah. dates. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were human. They were human exactly. beings. They, they, their entire existence is not centered around when did, where were they born? Who did they marry? What children they had? What were those children's names? And eventually where they died. They were, they had lives. So what, what did that look like? Uh, what did that look like in their time period? Uh, and one person had said in the chat, kind of in relation to this, that one of the writing groups that she's in has suggested writing a timeline. So you can do like a timeline of things that you know of like the facts you know about your ancestor and compare one with maybe like a history timeline. See where, where might it intersect. It's a very good suggestion. When you get into the professional level, there are things that you can keep taking it to more advanced levels, depending on, this is not for the beginner, this is the, for the person who's, who's done this for a while and wants to really write professionally. There's some, such a thing called the, called the genealogical proof standard. It has five elements. The first element is uh, do, do ex reasonably exhaustive research. So that means you look at all the sources you can to, to answer a genealogical question in all kinds of things, deeds, wills, court records, local records, newspapers, everything, and you assemble that. Uh, the second step is to is to create documentation for what you're looking at, and that can be intimidating for a lot of people. But there's books here on how to do that. The third part of it is to correlate and analyze all the data that you've gathered, and that can be a really hard step. But you look at things and try to piece it together, and then four, you 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 reconcile conflicting evidence because you're going to find record conflicts, and that's a hard thing to do because you're going to find things that 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 contradict each other. Ages of people will differ. And the five is you write, a, you write a soundly reasoned conclusion based on all the evidence that you've gathered. And that's sort of what you write about. And, and you can do that in multiple ways. And, and, and just writing conclusions, even if they're not finished conclusions, is, is, is a good thing to do. It summarizes what you've, what you've gathered together. So if you're researching somebody, you come in here and you've gathered some material out of family histories and county histories and censuses and so forth make a record of what you've looked at and then start just write up what you your research write up your research write a report of it uh, and, and so it's still fresh in your mind write what you looked at and save it save it on your computer and then when you go back to that family or you're working on it again you've got what you've looked at and uh, and then you can add to it and over time that can blossom into something even bigger into a family history but it doesn't have to start that way 
but also like keep in mind when you're writing you don't need to know everything in order right. to actually do the writing um i i was saying to john before we started that my aunt has you know over 30 years worth of research compiled some of which you know goes back to the colonial era and she is stuck on this one brick wall we all have the one that i don't i don't know if we will ever figure it out maybe not in her lifetime maybe not in my lifetime it may be just never but i keep having to tell her just stop looking at that and just write what you have for everything else and she's like oh I don't know, it's not perfect. I'm like, so what? So what? Just do the thing. Again, don't let perfection get in the way of progress. Amen, yeah. amen. So I hope this is lighting a fire under some of you. <laughs> uh, the next question is a good one for you because John, you do a number of, you do oral history stuff. You like interviewing people. Uh, this person was asking if you had any suggestions for convincing someone to talk. My grandmother refused to talk about my grandfather's grandmother, and she knew her. She j All she would do is just whisper, we don't talk about her. Wow. So, that can be really hard. Sometimes family yeah. stories can be really painful, and if people don't want to talk, it's going to be, it, it's a, it, it could sour your own relationship with them. You yeah. don't want to make someone talk about something that may have been painful. Yeah. Um, I would try to research what you can, try to go around the barn, so to speak, if there are any other relatives that might know the situation that can give you some, some clarity. There may not be if it's something way back in the past. And then there may be some stories that unfortunately will, will die with, with the person, which is too bad yeah. if it's too painful. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of things, illegitimacies and all kinds of things that happened in the past that were very much taboo at then, less so now. Our, our times have changed, but there were times when it was shameful or there were there, there was abuse, all kinds of things that can, dynamics that can happen in a family that can be very difficult to uh, to talk about later. And, and, and it's, it's like a hard thing. And, and we as genealogists and as family historians are, are sometimes opening up old wounds. Uh, and, and when we do our, this work, and, and, and it can be difficult. Um, so. Uh, I, um, when I was doing some oral histories of my grandmother, when she was in her late 80s, I had to be very... Uh, careful when bringing up her, her sister uh, because her sister died pretty young uh, of a massive, massive stroke that we believe was possibly caused from her husband who was abusing her. And my grandmother blamed herself for that, even though it was not, it wasn't her fault. She lived in another state at the time. But anytime you could bring up her sister, she would just kind of, she would get very upset and burst into tears. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful and just like, you know, empathy, right? Um, you don't want to push someone because the more you push someone to talk about something they don't want to, they're not going to talk to you anymore, period. Then you'll lose all conversation and all possibility of, of getting information and you don't want to do that. So you get what you can and work with what you can and maybe over time you can piece some more. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a really important question to ask, just because, you know, we do want to try to include oral history if we can, um, but, you know, don't, don't put that at the forefront where you ruin your relationship with somebody, yeah. Okay, so the next question, in gathering a lot of family stories from online, from one line of relatives, the main story thread is, for the most part, utterly depressing, and in many ways pretty terrible uh, but his it has occurred to me that maybe somehow they survived how they survived might be a better story is that a good approach to absolutely maybe like make it less of a downer yes you can find all kinds of dark things sometimes and, and how do you oh yeah how far dark how deeply do you want to go and how do you how do you talk about it it can be very difficult but overcoming it the fact that family survived it is itself a, a great story so there that you can you yeah. can turn a story into an advantageous way if you look at it the right way. Some of how I've written about some pretty dark things in my family story is the way I've looked at it for those individuals is these things that happened to them, maybe that is why they were the way they were. Maybe that's why they made the choices that they made later on down the line. And maybe that's why their children behaved in a certain way. Um, so the, the bad things can inform on the person, um, both good and bad. 
but that's that's life yeah Oh, this is a good one. My dad gifted us hundreds of short stories which covered all types of subjects regarding his life and has encouraged me to similarly write short stories of my family. Even mundane events have a touch of humanity when it, when it includes family events. Yes, that is very nice. Um, I'm really jealous of, of that gift. Uh, I wish my dad would get around to doing that for me. But if you want to do that, do it. Um, write about one Saturday morning when maybe your, your parents were being a little loud in the kitchen and you're a teenager and it's really annoying, right? Write, write about the, the mundane because that's we live in the mundane, right? We live in the everyday. So This book that's on your list, it's called How to Write Compelling Stories from Family History by Annette Gendler. has some great examples of just writing short snippets of stories and making them interesting. And um, uh, it's a good book, I recommend it. Uh, it's very short, but has, she has lots of good tips throughout the book on how to, uh, what yeah. you should think about it and how to frame it and so on. As we are winding down, I just wanna say, you all have some very wonderful questions, some very well thought out questions. And I'm really glad that all of you took the time out of your Saturday afternoon to join us for this. Uh, we do have one final question in the Q&A uh, and we're getting close to three o'clock as it is. So let's do this final question and, and then wrap up. Um, this person asks, when I do a family history included in a book in genealogy, there is a long, long list. Is there any way to search that book's contents in the catalog list listing? Okay, so you're asking if the contents of these books are indexed in our catalog. Um, no, they're not, because some of the books that we have don't have indexes at all. Uh, that would be so, a massive undertaking that I don't think our catalog can handle. Modern books that we get generally have good, we have excellent yeah. catalogers that work for our department who, um, yeah. who do index main families that are listed in indexes. But right. That's not always the case with an older book that was cataloged say in the 1940s uh, and may have a totally different approach and may not have the same level of cataloging or metadata yeah. that we call it that, that a modern book being cataloged would have. Yeah. So like a lot of the books, if, the, if you have collateral families mentioned in the book, those are, will quite probably show up when you search for those names. But this person was asking about a long list. Is there any research the book's contents? I mean, no. I mean, this this is where you just gotta go old school and just pull pull the books. And that is why when you visit us, you there are two different types of carts in our department of book carts. One is for reshelving. We ask that you don't reshelve things because you do us a favor by not reshelving. We actually count the books we reshelve. Uh, the other type of cart is your personal shopping cart. We have these little black carts, not much bigger than my desk chair, and you can drag that all around the department with you, put your laptop on it. If you think you're going to be in the stacks for a long time, don't leave your you know, personal belongings unattended. We'll load it up with books and then go, go, go get comfortable. That is why we have, that is why we have carts. Um, so the book that John mentioned, I see that somebody else is asking about that book. Uh, it is in the handout. Let me, let me copy the actual name of it with that citation because they, they would like to see it in the chat. One second. Well, John, do you have any final words to encourage just people? Do it. Just do it. Uh, if you're not thinking about doing it, just do it uh, and, and, and take small bites and, 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 and take the first step of, of what could be a long journey, but don't be overwhelmed by it. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, look at yourself as a curator wanting to tell and collect stories that are meaningful to your family and, and, and just begin. Uh, and uh, I think you'll be rewarded by it and, and uh, your descendants will be rewarded by it. So this is coming from someone who's written 16 books and I don't know how many articles. When did you write your first one? 
boy, I, you know, I, when I was in college, I, I was thinking of formulating my first Beatty, the, the Beatty book that I wrote like in the eighties. And it was a terrible piece of work. It was a, but it had a lot of stuff I gathered, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, it took a while to redo it. And when I redid it, I, I used it as a basis for things. And I did gather some good information with it, but it, I was quite young, but I looked at a lot of family histories. Uh, the other ones were reading. I was reading books about different, more famous families and, and, and getting ideas. So. Just because it's terrible doesn't mean it isn't worth doing. And I hope you all think about that as we go into the holiday season. Maybe you're spending more time with your family. This might be the time to write those short stories and share them, collect those stories. I encourage all of you to do so. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, John, for sharing your input. And I hope all of you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.